Nancy Netzer. I'm director of the McMullen Museum here at Boston College. And I welcome all of you to the opening of Gone. Gone is the first exhibition to bring together the site-specific work of internationally acclaimed artist Dorothy Crowell. Because many of these projects were presented for limited periods of time in remote locations around the globe, as varied as an ancient basilica in Turkey and an abandoned handball alley in Ireland, their audience and critical commentary have been limited. The McMullen is pleased to make these works accessible to a wider public, offering detailed documentation and an extended commentary on Dorothy Cross's contribution to the genre of site-specific art. The exhibition and accompanying book are the brainchild of Robin Leidenberg, a renowned scholar, literary and cultural critic, and professor of English at Boston College. Over a decade ago, our late colleague, Professor Adele Dousimer, co-founder of the Irish Studies Program, introduced many of us at Boston College to the work of Dorothy Cross, who has gone on to become one of Ireland's most celebrated contemporary artists. Since that time, Leidenberg has lectured and published widely on Cross. The McMullen exhibited several of Dorothy's sculptures and videos in two group exhibitions, Irish Art Now in 1999 and Air Ireland in 2003. Seeing clearly Cross's importance as an international as well as an Irish artist, the museum proposed devoting a solo exhibition to her, an <laughs> exhibition that would serve as a launching pad for a new study of the arts written by Leidenberg, and an exhibition that would coincide with, complement, and complete a major retrospective across the sculpture, photography, and video works, which will open this June in Dublin's Irish Museum of Modern Art. The ensuing collaboration between scholar and artist throughout this project was inspiring for all of us to witness. Both are so passionately engaged in exploring the space inhabited by the cerebral, the sensual, and the aesthetic. Both so genuinely and generously exchange their ideas so that the product could be much more than the sum its parts. And both Dorothy and Robin are due our deepest appreciation and gratitude tonight. <laughs> Given Robin Leidenberg's particular interest in the site-specific projects, we arrived at the bold decision to organize a show and catalog devoted to a body of work no longer in existence. Without attempting to recreate or simulate these projects, our chief curator, Stoney Conlon, designed an exhibition that enables viewers to imagine, from the traces left behind, the dynamic experience of audiences present at the original events. I'd like to ask Stoney to stand. in the university's media and technology services, 
refine the original documentary slides with advanced scanning techniques to arrive at all of the high quality images that you see in the exhibition and in the catalog. He also provided invaluable technical and artistic advice on image selection and formatting. We're grateful as well to Naomi Bloomberg, who coordinated this project from beginning to end, from copy editing the manuscript and wall text to advising on the selection of images. She was aided in these tasks by intern Jameson Jenkins. John McCoy designed the website and wall text and edited the audio tour, which I hope all of you will take. Keith Ake has crafted a stunningly beautiful book befitting Cross's inspired work. I recommend that all of you buy it. And Vera Cryokamp provided extraordinarily discerning editing and research advice on the text of the catalog. I also want to thank our museum docents, headed by Nancy Joyce. They've bravely taken on the task of explaining the mysteries of Cross's work to our visiting groups. And I invite all of you <coughs> to have a look at the list of others who contributed to this project, which is on the gallery wall. Now, as with all projects of this type, Gone could not have been undertaken without the support of Austin College, especially President William Leahy, Academic Vice President Jack Newhouser, who sends his regrets for tonight, Associate Academic Vice President Patricia Ballou, Graduate Dean of Arts and Sciences, Michael Smyer, and Dean of Arts and Sciences, Joseph Quinn. The Lowell Humanities Series, under the direction of Paul Doherty, has enabled Dorothy Cross to lecture here this evening. Major support for the exhibition and catalog was provided by the patrons of the McMullen Museum, chaired by Michael Daly. Mike, would you like to stand? with generous contributions from the Cultural Division of the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland and from the government of Ireland. Without all of their help, much of what we witnessed tonight, both textual and visual, would simply be gone. I now would like to take this opportunity to introduce our co-host this evening. She has been a supporter of this undertaking from the beginning and contributed to its success in numerous ways. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Isolde Moylan, Consul General of Ireland. Thank you for those over generous words, Nancy. It's um, such a great pleasure to be here this evening um, to celebrate so many different things. Uh, to celebrate um, the wonderful um, academic institution, one, one of the most eminent in the country, Boston College, and its long-standing um, historic um, links with uh, the island of Ireland, and also its um, contemporary links with Ireland, one of the, the most um, uh, well-known Irish studies programs covering so many disciplines, of which um, art is just one, um, we um, have uh, always enjoyed uh, having the opportunity to come here and renew our acquaintance. But um, we're also here to celebrate uh, the Macmillan Museum and all its achievements over so many years. They've mounted so many um, important original exhibitions um, here, and quite a number of those are uh, featured um, aspects of Ireland, Irish art and culture. And um, it's really of, to us of such enormous importance that um, there is a facility of this excellence here in Boston uh, that can show um, what is going on in the contemporary Irish um, uh, art scene. And most of all, of course, I, I would like to pay tribute to um, Nancy Netzer and the team of people who have work so hard in all of these exhibitions. It's such an honor and a pleasure to, to work with such fine people and such experts in their field who really have to do such a magnificent job in all of these exhibitions. 
But of course, most of all, we're here to celebrate um, Dorothy Cross, one of our most brilliant and original artists who's represented Ireland widely abroad, has had shows in many, many countries. And I and the government of Ireland are absolutely thrilled to be associated with this extraordinary exhibition. I just love this title of Gone. I think it's such a wonderful, <laughs> it's, it's gone, but it's not gone. <laughs> it's here, it's here with us. And um, it's, it's been our great honor to be associated with this event. We're very, very, very excited about it. And it's so great to have Dorothy here. She's going to have a chance to tell us about herself. And um, I hope that you've all had a chance to have a look at this most original set of works. And for me, the, the real thrill was having an opportunity of seeing the video of the famous ghost ship uh, that was so famous at the time it was in Ireland. I was serving my country in Africa at the time it was, um, it, was it came to a town very close to where I live, but I missed it. And uh, the video, I think, just really brings home what an extraordinary achievement that was. So anyway, um, I know that you're going to hear very much more about Dorothy from um, Robin, so I'm going to um, move on now. And thank you so much. And uh, it's great, great to see so many people here. Beauty out of memory and loss. 
I'd also suggest that Cross could be characterized as an artist of dispossession, because she seems to me to be more committed to the dissemination than to the preservation of the work. For example, when she speaks about the personal items that she often incorporates into sculptures and installations, ranging from her mother's china teacup to her grandmother's wedding dress, she says, I am passing these things away from me, breaking the line of inheritance, dispossession. <coughs> Cross brings this liberating sense of letting go to all of her work, but particularly to the site-specific projects featured in this exhibition, in which she gives up her art to an audience and to the effects of time and change and chance. Cross explores, above all, what is destabilizing in our common psychic experience of repression, desire, and loss, and she immerses herself and us in what is most disorienting in our encounters with the complex and powerful beauties of nature. Even after long and careful study, Cross's work remains richly enigmatic to me. Somehow, she makes the return of the repressed productive rather than merely repetitious. Somehow, she keeps faith with desire, even in the face of desire's impossibility. And somehow, she makes the inevitable wounds of loss bearable and communicable to others. Perhaps the heart of her secret method is to be found in her rare combination of playful wit, subtle intellect, and an openness to what she calls the bursting into beauty that can take us by surprise at any moment. I know there will be wonderful surprises in her talk this evening, so please join me in welcoming her. Destroy it at the last moment. 
And basically, he has this extraordinary skill. He could make it an eye if his eyes shut, really. Because it's this rhythm of, you know, 50 years of working, where with his hand, his flame, his mouth, he makes this organ of vision out of glass with little veins and irises and pupils. But at the very last minute, he blows and the thing pops. And for me, it represented the whole world of art at this, the whole world of making art, which is this attempt to represent something. But in the end, it's a total impossibility. It's never going to be the complete thing. So for me, it was kind of symbolic of that. And um, McMullen are going to screen this piece in a week's time on a building across the courtyard. And it's almost like, for me now, it stands for kind of the institution of, of, of vision in a way. But it, it, it's very difficult to see in a still here on, on the slide. But when you see it, it you'll be mesmerized in some ways by, by the skill and the rhythm of this man's hands. And if you blinked, you'd nearly miss and blow it up because it pops and it disappears. And in between these site-specific shows you saw upstairs, I do actually sit at home and make objects or photographs or quite rapid things. And I was invited to do a project in northern Norway um, in the late 80s, early 90s. And I was up doing, visiting the, the site. It was the only permanent piece I think I've ever done in my life. But I found a sieve in a folk museum that was made out of a cow's udder. Now, this is not a very good slide, but you can see it's a bit like an Irish, Irish barrel. It's got a wooden frame. The udder is stretched across the frame, and it's pierced with little holes. And you can see the little, three little teeth, and a, another hole is worn. And it was used as a sieve for sifting grain by the very efficient, economical Scandinavians, who used every part of the cow. And I was very, very fascinated by this object. I thought it was the most wonderful um, coll collision between utilitarian and art. It was very much like Merit Oppenheim's Fur Teacup, which is one of the most wonderful objects, I think, in the art world, which brings together domesticity and animal kind of sexuality in a fantastically wild way. And seems to uh, uh, you know, still be stunning in 2005. So what I did was I returned to Ireland, and I got a taxidermist to skin me cows the wrong way around. And I made a series of works called The Other Works. And they were basically focusing on the other of the cow. Because that sieve had shown to me another use of the cow. Because up to that point, milk-giving animal, nothing else. And it was a wonderful transformation. And it was a, a wonderful possibility that something could be used in a different way. So this was the first piece I made after the first supper that's up, uh, documented upstairs. And it was called Vaulting Horse. And the other was at the head end and then a horse in the saddle, and I just photographed it in Trinity College um, gymnasium, where the men didn't even comment. It was hilarious. I brought them to the <laughs> and they, they continued to do their exercises. <laughs> this piece is called Life Boy, and it, was this, it, it covered the hole in which you would put your head to try and save your life if you were drowning. But it was again this notion of the life giving force of the teeth covering up the hole that is another life giving force. And in the beginning, I used the four teats. But as the things progressed, I started <laughs> making them into single teats. And then it became clear to me why I was using the teats at all. Um, back then, I was very interested in Carl Jung. And post the other series, I became much more interested in Freud. Because Freud said in his very certain way of saying things, of course, every time we look at the udder of a cow, we think it's a penis. And I had not actually considered this at all when I was cutting the teats of the cow. This piece was called spurs and it speaks for itself a little bit. Because when the teeth actually dry, they harden almost as hard as a fingernail. This piece is called Dish Cover and Robin did refer to the notion of breaking the line of inheritance. And my mother is a wonderful woman who is still alive here in Ireland. And she hands me over these objects that we would have eaten our you know, chicken on Saturdays from under this dish cover. And she gives them to me with great faith, and I then transform them into these sculptures. <laughs> she, she thinks they're wonderful. <laughs> but this one was the big dish cover, and this one was the little dish cover. <laughs> so it was something to do with reduction and reproduction. And it wasn't denial of the breast. It was in no way trying to, um, to obliterate the notion of succor and nurture. But in the singular image of the teeth, you have the phallic. So these progress into the, the star of the show, who is called Amazon. And she's a tailor's dummy. They're she because they're a cow and they're female. Um, and in this particular case, the skin arrived in my studio. And at the time, I had very little money. They cost £100 a skin. 
and there was only one teat on the cow, and I thought, this is a rip-off, you know, it's, 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 you know, I'd be, and then this friend of mine said, look at the teat jar, it's incredibly big, and for this particular piece, it was such a happy accident, I named it Amazon, in reference to the Amazonian warriors who supposedly cut off one's breast so they could shoot their bows and arrows more accurately, but also the notion of the Amazonian territory, which is the virgin forest, the unknown, the mysterious territory. Um, and then came, oh, she once was put in a shop window in New York City. <laughs> what, what, what's very nice about, you know, again, I suppose this is a site-specific way of presenting Amazon, because she has been shown in museums and in the Venice Biennale and in, in galleries, but I do love the whole reorchestration of something and how meaning can change through that, something as simple as that. And New York is, you know, the capital of uh, the single object in the window, so it was very appropriate. I think a very expensive object in the window. This virgin shroud, she, she stands about six and a half feet tall. And this piece was very um, influenced by Marina Warner, who's a wonderful writer who wrote a book called The Cult of the Virgin Mary, Alone of All Your Sex, about 25 years ago which is all about how woman is represented and the Virgin Mary is represented, and um, it, it, it's truly a fantastic book. And that, that book really led me to make this piece. So what I did was I shrouded this form with the, the cow's skin, with the udder on the head. So the teeth almost read as a, a crown of thorns or a set of, of, of horns. And underneath the kind of battered skin, I lined it with the train of my grandmother's wedding veil. And my grandmother was a great old lady called Delia, and she gave it to me when I was about 15 and said, make a blouse out of that. And by the time I was around to line in the cow with it, I said to my mother, do you think Delia would mind? And we both decided she would be delighted. <laughs> but the notion of virginity in shrouding, in terms of the shroud of death and the potential of virginity, again, entitling like Amazon. Way back then, I was more, in, this is the early 90s, I was more interested in titling. I think returning to Ireland and that whole entrapment of language and adoration of the word, as a visual artist, you have a bit of a hard time around that. Um, I tried to play the game, I think, more then than I do now. Um, it's a different language, and I, I adore people who can use the word fantastically, like Robin can, but I have a different way of thinking. But when the word comes back and confirms or translates on top of the image, it's a fantastic kind of um, privilege to hear that, actually. Um, then this piece was called Croquet. It was made particularly for a little gallery in London where I show called Fritz Street. And the history of Croquet, in fact, originated in France and then came through the Anglo-Irish houses in Ireland. It became much more fashionable in Ireland before it arrived in England, where it became the cucumber sandwich afternoon tea game. And it's the only game that I could think of that contained four balls. So in fact, what you have is four balls covered in little cow's teeth and one mother ball that's too big to fit through the hoops. So that you could come down into this gallery and participate in a game of croquet, you could pick up a mallet and hit a ball. But what happened was that the little balls, even though they, they had been transformed or scaled down, or um, they still contained one teeth, so they still functioned as a nipple. They, they could now participate through this reduction, but they still wouldn't roll uh, properly because they had the teeth in the way. But the mother was unable to participate. So I, I, all these kind of things I, I find very amusing when, I, when I'm doing them, but also have you know other subcurrents. So for two years I worked with cows others, and then I decided I wouldn't do it anymore because I had a dream that I went into Macy's department store and everything was covered in cows' teeth. And I, I woke up in the morning and I thought, no, I have to stop. And it was the only time I sold things. These all sold to museums and things, and the galleries would say, Dorothy, you have to make more, but it seemed that it had to stop. So this is the final piece. And it's called Trunk. And I'm just showing you a distant shot because it's, it's quite a spooky piece. It's a pair of white cotton women's knickers. And into the gusset of the knickers, I've sewed one cow's teeth. So this is the only piece that refers specifically to the genitals. Whereas all the other ones might you know, refer to the head, the breast, whatever. Um, this piece, it was the knickers were thrown into the corner of the trunk. You weren't too sure whether they were hidden away for further use or whether they were discarded because they were disgusting. So you had this dual kind of sense around them, but certainly they were in a territory that was not really clear. And you know, there was that mixture between um, pleasure and disgust. Um, and that was the last other piece. Um, 
I'll show you a few more kind of single objects and then I'll one or two projects. This was a, a pro a, an exhibition that I had after the other series called Inheritance and this particular image was the kind of signature piece. And I actually made this for a maternity hospital in Dublin but rejected it because it, it had the image of a dead baby in it. I was actually going to do it, put it in the basement but they, were too se they thought we might upset some others. Because when you look at, at the x-ray of a baby, I had never actually seen the x-ray of a baby because they only x-ray babies when they're dead. But immediately I, I thought that the position of the fetus in the womb is very similar to the position of the brain in the skull. So on computer we set the baby into the brain space. And what I like about this is it's, it's non-sexed in that it could be a male or female head. And that it's about that first inheritance which is our mortality, which is something that is generally not considered. And you know, the notion of concept and thought also inherent in that birthing thing. Um, a piece called Bible, which was a Bible that was in our family, but our family weren't particularly Bible-based. And my mother found it in the attic and gave it to me. And I had it in the studio for a long time and didn't know what to do with it. And then decided to drill a hole through it. And again, didn't exactly know why. And thought, this is really wrong. This is, you know, you might mess up this book. It's quite a beautiful book. It has very nice engravings in it. But when the hole was drilled, which I actually succeeded in doing without tearing any of the pages with a black and decker drill and a big clamp, I, I opened the page at this point where the two Marys are grieving for Jesus at the tomb. It's the point where the man they loved has gone and they're heartbroken and the hole happened to land where their hearts had been. And for me, it was a perfect representation for what had disappointed me about Catholicism. Because in the, my education, that notion that the body was gone and had become spirit, in some sense, had denied the physicality in my life. But what I thought I had done in doing this was, was not iconoclastic. It had actually reconstructed this book into an icon that was more powerful for me because it had reinvested physicality into the book by making this beautiful, smooth hole. And actually, you could still read the Bible. There, there weren't that many um, words gone, if you wanted to. Um, also, looking at the rest of life, I'm very, I love it when you open the Irish Times and you see something that is nothing to do with rugby. And I, I, I did do this once. <laughs> and it, I call it Caravaggio. So the Irish Times let me into their vaults of rugby players and uh, with a macro lens. And I did a series of photographs um, based on the tenderness of the hands in, in rugby and how they envelop the ball. And in some ways, it, it's reinvesting that the heavy duty macho game with a certain tenderness. And trying to avoid the, the homoerotic aspect, which was, was, was actually difficult because it's incredibly homoerotic. But, um, and also, if you read rugby magazines, it's very amusing. I used to read them at the time. And you read things like, in the black bowel of the scrum, it would be the start of the chapter. It, 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 it's quite extraordinary. But I, I did these, um, these sets of photographs um, that had, actually did end up having quite religious, tender references. Um, this piece, I just, just to fill in a little bit on the ghost ship, because it's one of my favorite pieces. Um, my father uh, died a long time ago, but when we were kids, we, he used to bring us, he loved boats, and he used to bring us out uh, on the sea, outside our house on the sea every summer, to visit this lightship. And the sad thing is that these lightships have disappeared around the coast of Ireland. In the 70s, they were replaced with satellite boys. We have three ships that still remain. But when we were kids, there were more to reefs that couldn't have lighthouses built on them because they were too far out of water. And they were manned by about 12 or 13 men. And uh, we used to go out and give the men cigarettes and things and uh, then come back into uh, the place we live by the sea. So like 25 years later, I was back living in Dublin and I cycled past the ship every day on the way to my studio. And this open submission show came up in Dublin, which I normally don't ever go into because you know, there are these committee things you never win. And it was a very, very simple idea to borrow this ship and paint a phosphorus paint. And luckily, the, the Sea Scouts, who had been given it by the Commissioners of Irish Life, allowed me to borrow it and allowed me to paint it. And it was a kind of fantastic, um, kind of a Boy Scouty project. And I worked with a wonderful sea captain who actually made the event happen because we ran into so much bureaucracy and 
stupid insurance ne neurosis that it was nearly shelved and went way over budget and they all blamed me but in fact it was not my fault at all. <laughs> but in the end it worked and it only worked actually through lying because the sea captain would say yes to all the conditions and then not do half of them. And no, no, half of them were not necessary. Art, a lot of public art projects are so hindered by bureaucracy and, and insurance these days that it's making it impossible for a lot of projects to happen, which is terribly sad. But um, when we brought the ship into Dublin Bay, they kept moving it, they kept insisting we do all these you know, ultrasound tests on the hull. But looking back on it now, it was kind of fantastic to be pulling around this giant red ship that had no engine, you know, tugging it up and down the Dublin Bay and hosing down the bottom to get rid of the mollusks. And it was built in Glasgow in 1928, and it was a fantastic ship. Unfortunately, when the project was over, I feel rather guilty. I didn't try and save it, I think I was so exhausted, and was sold for scrap. Ireland does not have a good relationship with heritage still, I think. It's a little problem um, that needs to really be looked at, I think. Um, there has been painted, with paint that costs something like $250 a litre. So it had to be painted like gold dust because the ship was 140 feet long. Um, but it was, we needed that quality of phosphorus so that it would glow um, for the length of time that it did when it was in, in Dublin Bay. We built a rig, an out rig, off the side of the hull that illuminated it every 10 minutes. If you had this piece in the tropics, you could have it you know, out in the ocean, the sun would go down and it would glow on its own. But because of our um, climate in Northern Europe and Ireland, we had to actually assist it with UV lights. And that's what it looked like in the end. And some lights was more beautiful than others. Um, depending on the contamination by the lights that came out from Dublin, the sodium lights. But when it worked beautifully, it really did work beautifully. Um, this little piece is an introduction to chiasm, and I want to talk a little bit about chiasm, which is one of the opera pieces upstairs. I made a tiny video called Tika, and I vignetted five minutes of the famous Irish film Man of Aaron into it. And it was, it was a very sweet little piece that was very much about culture containing the wildness of nature. And that film represented the hero of Clive and family on the Iron Islands in the 1930s. And this is a teacup that belonged to my mother that in some ways had this kind of civilized afternoon tea aspect to it. So what you see in the little video, this is only a still of the first second, but you have three minutes of the little current in the storm scene going round and round and round and crashing on the rocks and then, you know, being broken up and then repeating itself. But actually, it was like a mini chiasm because when I was invited to work with Fear Company and this very wonderful man in Ireland who uh, used to run the Project Art Centre and is now taking the job as running the Abbey Theatre, he's this kind of maverick person who's just got a total sense of making art. And he, he came to me and said, Have you any ideas? And I said, I love handball alleys and I love a certain pool on the back of the Aran Islands. And that's how chiasm started. I found these four handball alleys on a road to Spiddle outside Galway. Architecturally, they're wonderful. They're two alleys built against two. So architecturally, they form a chiasm, which is this point where two lines intersect. But for my purposes, it was perfect because I wanted to work with two opera singers in different alleys next to each other, singing fragments of opera from different versions of operas, all of little fragments of, about love and loss. So he allowed us to paint the floors of the alleys, and we built a rig up the back where you could stand and look into them. We went to the Iron Islands, where one of the, it's a wonder of the world. This, ho this hole in the rock, which is about 100 feet by 30 feet, is called Palma Beish, which means the worm's hole. It's on a lower level of cliff below Dunane, it's on the famous Iron Islands, which are a, a, a set of three islands made of limestone stone off the coast of Galway. <coughs> And it's where a section of limestone has subsided and the ocean comes in underground and surges up and down in this thing. And it looks like it's made by man, but it was made by nature. And it's, it's truly extraordinary. But what I knew when I saw the, the two things in my head was that the proportions were very, very similar of the pool to those of the floor of the alley. So we went and we filmed Palma Beige from these different angles. You can see a distant shot of it there with the tide out. So we got a camera crew and a crane and shot it from these different angles with this um, a flexible crane and then projected it into the floors of the alleys. In one there was a soprano called Carol Smith and in the other Eugene Finkett 
tenor, and then we projected from 80 foot cherry pickers down into the floor of the audience. So it was, logistically it was quite tricky to do, but in the end, it was a terribly simple piece. They both walked in onto the same projection flipped over. When you viewed it, which is a problem upstairs with the video because we didn't really have enough, uh, enough money to, to document it properly, you could never really see the two alleys like this, unless you had some, a wide angle pair of eyes. If you were standing on one alley, you could see her more, more clearly and hear him in the distance. If you sat in the middle, you could move your head and see both of them. But it was very much about the one side of a relationship. They both sing these fragments from Romeo and Juliet, Ariadne of Naxos, um, uh, several different operas that I've not forgotten, or Orfeo, and they go from love to loss without interacting, but then occasionally they come to, to a duet, and you're aware that they're aware of each other on side, either side of the wall, but they can never meet. In the beginning, I, you know, I was conscious of Pyramus and Clisby and that whole notion of the lovers talking through the hole in the wall. I could have choreographed them that they have met every single time at the same place on either side of the wall, but I decided I'd leave it to chance and see if they did hit that point together without my choreographing them, but they actually never did. And they were walking on these images of pulsating waves in that rectangle of sea that repeated and repeated and repeated, but were never actually the same. And each night they sang three sequences of the music that was never actually the same. And they were standing on water that was slightly different time in the, in the take each time. So it's very much about that wave of love and loss of desire and lack of desire, of, of chance in love and, and that togetherness. But what, what held us together in some sense was the music, but if you were standing too far <coughs> to the left, it was very, very hard to hear the tenor, because they were not mic'd and there was no orchestration. And that, no, um, that notion of kind of repetition, some people came and only saw one sequence, but you could come each night and see three sequences, because it's only 20 minutes long. And then you really got a sense of, of, of the chance of where those singers or lovers or non-lovers could be at any one kind of point. Um, this next piece I talk about is, I, I think I put these slides in because this woman was an amazing woman. A friend of mine told me about her and she's dead and her name is Maud de Lapp. She died in 1953. She was born in 1866 on Valencia Island in uh, County Kerry. And this person told me that she succeeded in breeding jellyfish in bell jars in her father's house in 1902. And I'm a scuba diver and uh, very kind of obsessed by the sea, and I, I've watched jellyfish when I was diving for years, and they're extraordinary when you're with them underwater, they're very, very um, lyrical and balletic. And I just thought, oh my God, a Victorian woman who had succeeded in doing this. So I was in New York at the time, and I heard about this grant called SciArt, who was trying to get scientists to work with artists. So I phoned my brother, who's a marine biologist, and said, will you work with me on a project about this woman? And I told him about her, and he said, yes. And really, it was Maud's story that managed to get us the money to make this strange little film we made, which was called Medusa. And we worked together for two years. My, 100 years after Maud had died, my brother started researching a jellyfish that lived in Australia called Chironex Beckeri. I went down to Valencia Island and started researching Maud. It turned out that this house is where Maud lived. My brother's wife's cousin's husband happened to own it. So we had immediate access to film there. It's under threat of the demolition ball, again, like so many things in Ireland, for so-called progress, and it's a wonderful house. So what we tried to do was put together, splice together this strange, fragmented story of Maud with a strangely fragmented story of the jellyfish because actually very little is known about a jellyfish. Um, that's Maud on the left-hand side with the hat and the shape of the jellyfish. She was actually very glamorous. She wore little belts and she was very small, very tough. She and her two sisters were the only remaining people of the family that didn't marry. She was one of ten children and the daughter of a Church of Ireland minister. I was lucky enough to meet two of her nephews who were still alive living in England, who died actually a few weeks after I met them. And they told me tiny stories of Maud, but they both differed enormously. <coughs> and there were a few things that I held on to, because there was no full story about her, which actually I kind of thought was wonderful. 
This is a common jellyfish that is in Ireland called the moon jellyfish that doesn't sting. We don't employ those jellyfish in Ireland really. Um, they, most of the really venomous ones live in, in the southern hemisphere. This is her sisters holding up a little black cloth behind a whale skull. They were very uh, wonderful, the, the, uh, these three women. They found a whale on the shore and they had the head chopped off and they buried it in their asparagus patch and it got cleaned off by the worms and then they took this, this photograph on a little table in the garden. And I tried to find the little table but didn't manage to, but the Natural History Museum in Dublin lent me the real skull and we filmed it on a copy of the table in the ruined house as part of the film. So the film became this slight hybrid of truth and, and, and fragment, punctuated by jellyfish, and my brother's present day research of Carrie Slepper. This is her working men chopping the head off the Cuvier Fouet with a saw and a kind of carving knife, which I think is quite very proud of Ledge Island. This is one of the most wonderful places in Dublin, the Natural History Museum, if you ever visit Dublin. It's a gem, it's truly a fantastic Victorian uh, Museum of Natural History. And actually in July, the new director has agreed to allow screen Medusa there and in a hallway in the back of the Natural History Museum. Because Maud was very, very friendly with them and adored. She only visited it once, but she would send them things up on the train from Kerry. And she sent them a live turtle with a letter that said, Dear Dr. Shaw, I hope you enjoy this turtle. And then a letter back from Dr. Shaw saying, Thank you, Mr. Lack, for the turtle. Unfortunately, we had to kill it. So you know, she sent it live on the train from Kerry. And in those days, it would have been a kind of rough ride, in a sense. But the Natural History Museum were very, very sweet and lent me all these things that Maud had uh, actually donated. It was a period of great richness in terms of uh, curiosity, that Victorian period at the turn of the century. There, you, people in Boston are probably very familiar with the wonderful Blasco flowers at the Peabody Museum. Well, these are Blasco moths of jellyfish. They were actually more famous for jellyfish and marine uh, invertebrates before they started making the flowers. But the Dublin Museum has one of the best collections in the world. So I started researching those people, seeing were there any connections. Maud was aware of the Blaschkas and Ernst Haeckel, but they, she didn't meet Haeckel, even though he did come to Ireland during her lifetime. I went to Palau in Micronesia to film jellyfish. This is a, a wonderful geological area where limestone has, has risen up and trapped these lakes. And I went with a friend of mine who fil and we filmed these jellyfish over a period of days. And they didn't sting, and you could float through these lakes full of pulsating jellyfish uh, that were like these giant kind of atomic bombs. So it's an amazing place in, in, in the world. Ernst Haeckel in Jena, who had a house called Villa Medusa, he was known as the Darwin of Germany, contemporary of Maud's and, and the Blaschkas, and his entire house is patterned with jellyfish. And it's near Weimar in the former eastern side of, of Germany. Um, and this is a, a rhizostoma chandelier in the Museum of Oceanography in Monaco that was designed by Haeckel. And this is a drawing actually done by Maud de Lapp on a tiny piece of paper of a valera of jellyfish that her nephew gave me as a present, which is the most beautiful thing. She was very, she, scientifically she was very respected. My brother actually read some of her papers before he agreed to do the project, even though she was never trained professionally as a scientist. She received um, uh, an award before she died, and she was given an honorary membership to the Linnaean Society. This is her little boat that she went out collecting jellyfish and food for the jellyfish. She would never have had that access to the underwater realm. You know, she went out in her long skirts and her hat. And she had a fish viewer that was like a megaphone with a glass bottom that she looked over the side of the boat, which I actually have also, which is a, a, an amazing kind of handmade thing. But that would have been her only way of viewing the underwater world. Um, then I came to Boston and I had heard a story that she'd fallen in love with a scientist called Edward Brown who had been sent by the British over to do a flora and fauna study of the Ledge Island in 1895. He had not fallen in love with her and had returned to England. And she sent him a box of wild violets all the way from the Ledge Island to Plymouth every birthday for the rest of his life. And that was one fact that was definite because the two nephews told me. So I was very happy in, in the Peabody to find that there was a little bunch of wild violets with a bee on it made by, in glass by the Blaschkas. So the, my side of the film was made up of these fragments of, of, of what I presume is truth. This is the only photograph in existence, we think, of Maud on the top of the Skellig Rock in County Kerry with 
Edward Brown, who one of Nebby said was just a cad. Uh, he gave me a personal photograph, and in the back, in, in this dark green paper, you could see his handwriting saying ETB, and we can recognize them all. But that was before he, he left. Then my brother's research was on paranoid collectivite, the most venomous jellyfish in the world. It has killed more people than crocodiles and sharks put together in Australia. They live from Brisbane down the south side of, um, uh, of Australia, and some part of the west. They, their tentacles are spot kill you. The tentacle, if it touches enough of your skin surface, shoots off these uh, nematocysts which enter your nervous system and kill you within minutes. Apparently in agony. Um, they, obviously the bell is a poison. This is a, a Professor James Seymour, who is a zoologist in Cairn University, who helped us, who's an expert on jellyfish. The, then I, Eugene Ginty, who had sung in the, the handball alley, I asked him, could he sing underwater? <laughs> water to each other. So we went to our friend's swimming pool and uh, uh, he sang Moore's Melody and Come Into the Garden Hall and All Things Bright and Beautiful and Where Are You Walk Underwater. And we recorded them because the thing about this little film, you could apply, you know, Pergolesi and it would be stunning. But I wanted to try and make a soundtrack that was not, you know, it's too easy in some ways to use real classical music. So I wanted something which had the nature of the jellyfish. So we worked with Eugene Underwater, a wonderful man who worked on the glass harmonica, and a thing called the water phone, which is an instrument made of two metal things that look like frisbees, but the tune, you fill it with water and it makes the sound of kind of a, a beaked whale. Um, and that's what we punctuated the soundtrack with. And this is the tentacle of the Caranex plethora. We went to Australia two, two summers in a row, and um, because they only exist really for six months. And this is my brother peeping over a tank. We had to build a rig, bring the Karanex into a tank, and then film them against a grill so my brother could bring them back to our, the footage back to Ireland. And they swim through jet propulsion, and they're very, very fast swimmers. Um, they're fantastic. There's fantastic information about a jellyfish, but no very few real facts. They do have 12 eyes. They have three eyes in each corner of their box. They're known as box jellyfish because they're cubo medusas. They're kind of square shaped when they're in volume. And when you look at their eyes under a microscope, they look very like our eyes, but they don't have a brain. But the James Seymour has seen them hunt and seen them put their tentacles up through the water and put a crab down off a rock. So they must have some kind of intelligence, but because there's no proof, there's no discourse. It's hilarious. It's that one big difference between a scientist and an artist. I'm there thrilled to bits about the not knowing, and they're desperately frustrated by the not knowing. And so my brother did this very accurate um, documentation of the pulsations of the bell of the jellyfish. But my brother is actually a geneticist more than a biomechanics expert. So he was much more excited to taking genetic fingerprints of the Karanex leprae for the first time ever in the world. But for such a, a terribly uh, dangerous animal, very, very little is known, uh, which is quite shocking, actually. Um, very little money in Australia is put into researching them. And just to to show how things can be shown differently. Halfway through the project, I was commissioned by the Public Art Development Trust in London to do a piece for the National Theatre on the South Bank, where there's this giant concrete block kind of where the theatre steps go up and down. And I made a version called Come Into the Garden Mod. But you can, it's wonderful because you can see it from across the Thames, and lots of artists have done projects on this wall. So the story of Maud is kind of happening as people went past on buses. And then, this was the final Medusa, which for the first time was screened in the tiny church of Ireland, which was her father's church when she was alive. So Medusa was seen up in the altar space. And it was really beautiful because it's a tiny church and it's on this island you have to take a little ferry over. So that was the first venue and the next venue will be the Natural History Museum. And in some ways pieces like that become much more embellished and richer by being in venues like that. Now I've seen this in a museum in Melbourne, but it's, it, it's, a, different, it's a different thing. Um, and just an offshoot, you know, back to the studio on your own and how something becomes an artwork that exists in its own right. My brother's, you know, I've always used my brother for kind of scientific information. I'll phone him up and ask him about the sex life of a cuttlefish, and he, he won't ask me why, he just immediately go into it. <laughs> um, um, he, he told me that jellyfish are 98% water and 
cutest sound animal. So I, I thought to myself, fantastic, you know. And when you're on the beach, you can see them defecating sometimes. So I, I got some of my grandmother's old pillowcases made out of linen. And I put these compass jellyfish that are common in Ireland on these, on these pillowcases and then let them dry in the sun. But because the climate in Ireland is so kind of damp one minute, hot the next, it took weeks of kind of really putrid kind of rotting. And one or two succeeded, but when they did succeed, what you get is this fantastic shroud of terrain of jellyfish, <laughs> I think. It's, it, it, it's got this mad kind of dirty, kind of steep though because they're brown, but also this kind of radiance to it. Um, people don't really like them, I think, because um, they think it's smelly on jellyfish and they don't buy them. But I actually think they're incredibly beautiful. <laughs> I call them jellyfish drawings. And actually, a wonderful woman in, in uh, the National Museum in Dublin who, who spends her life kind of treating 15th century hairballs with lacquer so they don't rot, she, she gave me this um, material to paint onto them, so hopefully they won't rot. Now, I'm aware that you've been sitting here for a long time. I, I've only one or two things more to tell you about. But this, I'm just showing you this venue. Again, it's that notion of life and sequence and happy accident. When I was researching Maud on Valencia Island, I saw these signs pointing to grottoes, so I went up this road for a few miles and found this grotto that's also a slate quarry. And up in that hole in the top is the Virgin Mary and St. Bernadette. And in the 50s, when Marian shrines became terribly popular around Ireland, the church placed a shrine here with little railings and a little pelican fountain and a set of statues that actually the islanders need to go up and down on a 90-foot ladder to scrub the Virgin Mary and St. Bernadette when she got slimy, when she got too wet. You know, incredibly dangerous maneuver. And that slate quarry was very famous in the late 19th century for cutting slate that housed the Houses of Parliament in London, the Paris Opera House, a railway station in San Salvador. And then it shut down for a long time, and then a local man recently opened it up again, and it's functional as a slate quarry. So you have this wonderful collision between nature, industry, and religion. And the, the parish priest was very sweet, and he said yes, he couldn't put an opera there, and the slate quarry man said yes, it was fine. It was, the only problem was kind of health and safety, because the, the stones tended to fall down. <laughs> we, decided to, we decided to do, I went to my, a friend of mine called um, James Conway, who used to run an opera theatre company in Ireland, and asked them would they produce an opera here with me, and I thought of doing Orpheus and Eurydice, which, you know, kind of obvious, Entry in the Underworld and all that, and he was the person who suggested to me the Stab at Matter by Pergolesi, which, for any of you who know it, is exactly the right thing, because it's the most beautiful music written by a man who died when he was 26. It's this 30 minute, in, 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 in essence it's a prayer by two evangelists who are talking about passion. And so what we did was we set two singers and nine Baroque players in this cave, and they came out of the depths of the back, and this is for the Pergolese. And it so happened that it was the rain lashed and the wind blew, and it was elementally furious. And last August for three days, we performed the piece um, in the quarry. And it, it was just, in the end, it was incredibly beautiful because the acoustics were perfect and the location itself was amazing. In the very end, when the Pergolesi ended, they had been dressed as factory workers. They came out looking filthy, dirty, and tired, and kind of neglected. And they began the performing quite dispassionately and kind of bored because they'd come off of, you know, for their lunch break from some awful shift in their quarry. And the, then as the piece continues, they, they start recognizing the passion within the piece of the Pergolese. And I really feel that in life, you know, the humdrum of life, sometimes it's very easy to forget about passion and very hard to regain it. And it's something like the beauty of the Pergolese is, is a thing that can remind you about beauty in, in life. And I think we don't give ourselves enough time to consider that. So when the singers leave, and return back into the blackness of the cave. A, a giant 25 meter screen came out of the back of the cave and blasted industrial noise at you and had images of the back of the cave, which was like a big Wagnerian kind of um, set. In fact, it looked fake because it was so wonderful. And interspersed with shots of big machines cutting slate. So it was kind of evidence of the life in the cave of the industry. And then it ended. Um, 
This is where I live in Palomara. A few years ago, I moved from Dublin because Dublin has become very expensive and you can't get warehouses to work in anymore. And I guess I lost my lease. So I moved to live way out here in North Galway. It's unusual to see snow, but it was a cold winter. And a lot of my work now is kind of looking at nature. And I find things like a dead sheep who accidentally stuck his head in a lobster pot, you know, which is so totally surreal. And, you know, I watch these things, and then I actually gathered the lobster pot, kept the skull, and had it covered in silver. So it's some kind of residue of um, the real life that exists around me that I'm trying to kind of harness in a strange way. This is a dead gamut I found, and my dog got bored and went to sleep next to it. Um, and that, that gamut is in a show next week in London attached to a sky blue parachute that military people jump out of airplanes so they hope they can't be seen on, you know? So it's, it's, it becomes kind of a cycle of, um, and I'm getting more and more interested of how, how those things can be gleaned from real life and still survive through this kind of sanitization, certainly of the gallery world, not so much of site-specific work because the, the, the privilege of that is the power of the place like the Slate Quarry, or the Hamble Valley, or Dublin Bay, or what, wherever it is you're doing it. And there's something just un unbelievably exciting about working in places with that kind of power. Because, because you know, the nature of galleries, you know, they're not powerful. And they're, by their own nature, kind of neutral, in a way. And I, I'm going to end, actually, with these few slides, because this is a place when I moved to Panamara, I was introduced to a man called Mikey. And I never met Maud because she was gone and dead. But Mikey was a, a total artist. And he lived for 40 years in England and came back to live in this house in Panamara. And was, he kept it like some strange art installation. But he never talked about art. He sat by a fireplace and painted red like a Rothko painting. And he had an incredible sensibility. And these are just photographs of his garden. And he painted the, the, the stone so you wouldn't trip. And everything was just this unselfconscious beauty. And the economy of it, the man had no money. He had no electricity. He had no running water. He had no toilet. And he lived there. He said to me one day, he said, Dorothy, I'm as comfortable in this house as I would be in Buckingham Palace. And there was something about the simplicity of his attitude to life that, you know, he should be in every art institution in the world because it was exquisite. And I said to him once, did you learn your way of looking and gathering things or were you born with it? And he just looked at me with a grin on his face, you know? It, it, in some ways it's such a stupid question because obviously he was born with it. This is his, his dog, Cynthia. Uh, this, is, this is his toilet. Um, he died in January, and it's, it's kind of tragic because, well, maybe it's not. Maybe there are very few people like this in the world. But I, I brought people to visit him. Um, my friend Dick is here tonight, and he went to visit him. And there was something kind of so perfectly unegocentric about his way of working his life. Because I, I believe really that art is not separated from life. The grandiosity and pomp around it is something that is so destructive. And when you come to visit or um, witness something like some, it's a phenomenon like Mikey. It actually brings you back into the whole sense of what art is. Like this is a harness for his horse that he repaired with string, so beautifully. And this might be the end. These are his hedges that are kind of like Versailles. And we're very well tended. His, his little lamp. It was all made up of garbage, so there's nothing of value. That's his chair and his gas cylinder and his iron appliance. And this is where he sat on the other side of the road, next to his church stand. And I think the reason I end with that is because maybe, this, in some ways, this is an aspiration. Mikey is an aspiration. You know, it's if, if you're looking at uh, levels uh, in terms of life and spirit. There's something fantastic to be learnt in his way of not acquiring and existing. And everything, he would put a plastic flower next to a real flower. And it was the hierarchy dissolved. And that's something that's actually essentially
what is, I think what it's all about. So I think because you've been sitting there for a long time, I'll stop and uh, thank you very much for listening.